So following the video where we busted some myths and very widely spread assumptions about sergers, you guys, especially those people who already have some sergers at home, had a lot of questions, a lot of questions. So in this video, I will answer all of those and hopefully we'll give you those useful tips and tricks and some of the cards up my sleeve so that way you can continue starting with serger more efficiently with better success. So let's get started. So the first question is, and I'm paraphrasing these, and the first question is about serger thread, and isn't serger thread expensive, and if so, how to go about it, and isn't that going to add the cost of an actual project plus an ongoing cost after buying a serger machine? And the answer is yes and no, but I do have here uh, a little hands-on demonstration for you guys. So for five years, going on six years since my husband gave me my serger as a gift, which I truly appreciate, don't want to go anywhere without my serger, I barely ever, barely ever use all four spools of the same color except for white, beige, navy, and black. And those are the colors of fabric that I usually sew the most with and that's the reason why I do have all those four matching, but only for those colors. For the rest of my project, whether I'm sewing for baby as a gift or whatever else I'm doing, I do this. So for example, let's say I'm sewing bright pink t-shirt for my child. The first thread I'm gonna use is usually going to be the thread that matches the closest to the fabric of the project. And that is going to be your needle thread, your first one right over here. After that, I'm just gonna try to see if I have matching shades of the same color. So we're going for pink and pink and I know this is peach but imagine this is another shade of pink and this one like this and ta-da that's it now you can also just not buy these and use white or beige after that you can also do that because really the only thread that you're gonna see if you ever going to see it on the outside let's say um, after a really significant stretch or something like that it's going to be your first needle thread everything else is going to be neatly concealed on the inside in the seam now another thing is since I got my first serger I barely ever buy any of those little spools for my sewing machine I just use these for both my serger and my sewing machine so that way I don't have to buy a duplicate of uh, the same color thread and smaller spool and bigger spool and if you are asking a question how to use this big of a spool in your sewing machine well you just take you know like a coffee cup you put it in a cup and then you continue threading your sewing machine the normal way you just place the cup like on like behind your sewing machine on the side and that does the trick without a problem. And I truly use this trick all the time. If you watch my videos, you probably have noticed that uh, barely ever all of my threads are gonna be matching. Usually they're an assortment of the same shade of color. The closer I can get to it is better, um, but it totally works and it definitely saves money. And you know what, I can feel another question brewing regarding what we've just discussed. And yes, I do use the same spool for both sewing machine and the serger. Even when I need to top stitch, let's say I just completed a seam with a serger and then I need to top stitch it or do whatever else to it. Because this is a spool that goes into the first placement right over here, usually that is the last step on threading. So I don't mind taking it out re-threading my sewing machine, doing a top stitch, and then if I do need to continue with a serger, taking it out of the sewing machine and putting it back in the serger. I don't see that as too much work. It's just me. Next question is from Ricky, and Ricky has been a subscriber of this channel for many, many years, so I'm super happy to answer this question. And she's asking, how do you like to go about serger ends and how to finish them? And two ways that I do it. Number one, you get a crochet hook and you uh, loop that serger end uh, through the actual serger seam and it stays there nice and neat and tucked away and uh, you don't have to really worry about anything else. And the second thing is, I just tie a knot. I really do that. You take a, a pin needle and then you kind of disintegrate that seam a little bit so that way you have four different threads and then I just do a, a knot. And um, it just really depends on what I'm sewing. I also tie knots when sometimes for whatever reason my serger end tail is too short to be uh, looped through and I know that it's gonna pop out. Um, and yeah, then tying a knot is not a problem and I've been doing this since I started sewing on a serger and none of the seams have gone undone if you are wondering. 
Next question is about neatly sewing two seams together on a serger and making sure that they match. And I'm assuming that the conversation is about this instance where you have a sleeve with the seam over here, then you have a side seam. And when you are inserting the sleeve, you want to make sure that the side seam over here and the side seam over here match without them moving apart, which if that's the case, and a lot of the videos I actually show you guys that little tip and trick. So what you want to do is when you're laying your fabric right sides together and you're ready to insert your sleeve, for example, the, the point where you're trying to match the seam of the sleeve and the seam of your bodice, you need to make sure that one serged seam is facing this direction and one serged seam is facing the other direction. So that way, when you put them together, you're minimizing bulk and you're not concentrating that bulk just on one side. So when it actually goes through the serger, the serger is not gonna like chew up your fabric and stretch it, which usually results in that seam moving. So your one seam is here and then the other seam is here and then of course there's a seam in the middle um, and it's not matching. So if you use that little tip and trick which I show you guys in quite a few of my tutorials then you will be all set with no problems. And another thing that you can do you can also baste it together either by hand or by sewing machine and then just remove that basting stitch after your serger is um, you know your serger work is done. So that's another thing that you can do to make sure that you neatly finish your seams where they where they should match. So quite a few also asked about sewing curves and sewing curves neatly and how to go about it. And a couple of things that come to mind and just because surgery is such a fast machine doesn't mean that you can uh, use that speed all the time and it doesn't mean that that speed is at an advantage all the time as well. And that especially is true when we talk about sewing curves. So what I usually do, is, especially if the curve is really kind of like sharp or really narrow, hand crank it. So over here, hand crank it, never hand crank it back, always forward, always forward, at least that's what they told me at the dealership. Now, another thing is you want to make sure that sometimes you lift up your presser foot and then reposition your fabric and then um, lower it again hand crank a couple of times or maybe go really slowly with your foot pedal then again lift it up reposition the fabric lower it and then continue sewing your curve and uh, yeah easy as that you know you just need to make sure that you go slowly and you can hand crank it if you need to and also lift up your pressure presser foot and low and reposition your fabric and lower it again so that way you can really make sure that you go around the curve nice and neat and if you feel that at the curve you're cutting away more fabric than needed just because it's really hard to make that curve work on a serger, lower your knife. So that way you don't have to worry about cutting away um, some of the fabric in case if you need to undo your serger seam later. Now, a lot of you also asked me to do some demonstrations on my serger and do certain techniques and use different attachments, and I would love to do that. However, it kind of loses its point because every serger really is very different. What works for my brother is probably not gonna work for your Bernina or for your Juki because there are different sergers. So my best advice would be uh, take your instructional manual and follow that one to the T. Um, believe me, everything is right there. And that's what I did when I wanted to try out my flat Locking, which I use quite a bit to finish really nice hems of baby t-shirts or my t-shirts or any other knit garments and I literally just followed my instructional manual step by step tried on the scrap fabric first and yeah that's the best way to go about it really and of course, you know, same goes about oiling, cleaning, or any other maintenance of your surgery. You have to stick to what your manual tells you. At least that would be my best advice because again, every single one of them is different. And here's another question that was coming up quite a bit in the comment section. And that is, what is the difference between a serger and a cover stitch? And what I can tell you is, oh boy, where to begin? If you do want a video on what is the difference between a serger, a sewing machine, and a cover stitch machine, and whether you need a cover stitch machine in your life or not, do let me know about that in the comments below. I do have a cover stitch machine. It was also a gift and it's, um, it's an interesting machine for sure. So do let me know if you would like to have more information about it. And until next time, happy sewing, happy surging. I hope I did answer some of your questions. I gave you little useful tips and tricks on how to use your serger more efficiently with better success. Thank you so much.